Hello, my name is James Spudich. I'm from Stanford University, and I'm very excited to tell you about um, some very recent research going on in my laboratory um, that involves a dream. Um, and it has to do with what we have now called the myosin mesa. And this is related to the basis of hypercontractility caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations. So what are uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations? So HCM, as it's called, affects one out of 500 people. So this is not a rare disease. Um, it was discovered by Christine and John Seidman more than 25 years ago uh, to be a monogenic inherited disease. So a very large number of HCM mutations which are single residue change, missense mutations, results from mutations in human beta cardiac myosin itself. Uh, many also uh, are involved in other sarcomeric proteins, but they're all in the sarcomeric proteins, some in tropomyosin troponin, uh, and so on. But 40% of all known HCM mutations are in myosin. And so I'm going to focus on that for this short presentation. This is the most common form of monogenic inherited heart disease that results in, and this is very important to remember, it results in hypercontractility of the heart. Later, you develop hypertrophy, fibrosis, and sudden death. So this is the disease that causes young athletes to keel over from sudden death on the basketball court, and in years past, uh, one didn't know what was going on, but now it's quite clear that these are people who are carrying such an HCM mutation. But even at the earliest stage, before you have any symptoms, your heart is hypercontractile. So if you're carrying one of these mutations, it's as if you're out for a jog. The problem is you're doing that 24 hours a day your whole life. And um, at, at some point, your heart starts to rebel against this, and it hypertrophies, undergoes fibrosis, and so on at later stages. Anyway, it's the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in individuals under the age of 35 years. And my entire lab now works on this full time. Uh, this is our focus. So from my earlier lectures in this series, you've learned that contraction of the heart muscle uh, is because the cardiomyocytes contract. And you learned that the cardiomyocytes have these repeating striations, which result from sarcomere structures, where the thin actin-containing filaments are attached to these gray structures, which in fact are called Z-lines. Um, and the myosin, uh, which has a long tail and two heads, is making up these bipolar thick filaments, and that these individual uh, bipolar thick filaments um, are, with, with heads oriented in opposite directions, are grabbing and pulling on the actin filaments to cause this sarcomere to contract. What I didn't really emphasize in my earlier lectures is that there's something called the duty ratio, okay? Which means, as you can see in this diagram, which I've drawn to scale, that uh, you have some heads which are bound strongly to the actin and producing force, and I've colored them green. And then you have a lot of heads which are yellow because they're in part of the ATPA cycle where they're getting ready to go onto the actin, but they're not on yet. So at any snapshot of time during a systolic contraction, you only have about 20% of the heads actually in a force-producing state, because the others are getting ready to go on. And that's called the duty ratio. And it's a ratio, as shown here, of the strongly bound state time of the chemomechanical cycle, which we call T sub S, divided by the total cycle time of the chemomechanical cycle, which we call T sub C. And that ratio, as I said, is about 0.2. Okay, um, so that's shown here in the chemomechanical cycle that we've talked about in the previous lectures. 
where here's the green head that is bound in producing force because it strokes as phosphate is released. And then here are those, yellow, those orange heads, which are getting ready to go on. And this part of the cycle is only um, a small fraction of the total cycle time. So this is the strongly bound state, Ts, uh, and the total cycle time is the time it takes to go around that cycle. The velocity with which your muscle contracts is related to this stroke size divided by this strongly bound state time. So velocity is distance divided by time. Uh, and the distance and displacement, as you know, is about 10 nanometers, because we've talked about that previously. Um, and the strongly bound state time is in the millisecond time range. Uh, and and the, the muscle can't contract any faster than the heads can let go. So the relationship of the velocity of contraction to these parameters is, is, is something of the order of d over ts. Now, the thing about muscle that is the most important parameter, probably, is the power output. And that comes from what muscle physiologists cause, call the force-velocity relationship. Okay. Clearly, if you're thinking about your skeletal muscle, if you try to lift something very light, you can do that very quickly, okay? And so if you're, so what we're plotting here is on the y-axis is velocity, and on the x-axis is the load on the muscle, how heavy the thing is you're trying to lift, which is related, of course, to how much force you can produce to lift it. And so if you're lifting something very light, you know, you can lift it very quickly, but as you try to lift something heavier and heavier, you're much slower. And eventually, you'll get to a point where the load matches your force capability, and you can't lift it at all. And, um, and power is simply the force times the velocity in physics. Uh, so when you multiply any velocity point here by its force value, you get a power point. And you know, when you have no force, you have zero power. If you have no velocity, which is this end, you have no power. And so you have a power which, in your skeletal and cardiac muscle, is operating in this range of load. This is why you want to keep, in your case of your heart, your blood pressure lower. Because if your blood pressure, which is the load in your cardiac case, is, gets too high and you're too far out here, your power output's going to start to drop and you're working too hard. Well, the velocity, as I said, is related to d over ts. What is the force of the muscle related to? Well, it's the intrinsic force of each individual myosin motor multiplied by some term, which is the number of heads that are actively on and producing force. But that's not the total number of heads in the muscle, right? It's the number of functionally available heads multiplied by this duty ratio that I told you about already. So it's pretty simple. The ensemble force in the muscle should be an intrinsic force multiplied by this duty ratio multiplied by the number of functionally accessible heads for interaction with actin. So this is the way to think about uh, the force velocity curve and power output. So as I said, there are sort of four key parameters, which kind of simplifies things. Uh, there's velocity, there's intrinsic force, there's the cycle time, and there's the number of functionally accessible heads for interaction with actin. OK? I'm going to tell you a story about, we're studying many of these mutations, but these eight we now have a pretty complete set of data on. Uh, for measuring these various biophysical and biochemical parameters. And uh, these are the eight, and as you can see, they're kind of scattered throughout the molecule. Two of them, H251N and D239N, are called pediatric or early onset mutations. These are so severe that children carrying 
these mutations die very, very young. Terrible, terrible. Uh, the others are adult onset and might not affect you until you're 30 years old, 40 years old, even 50 years old, depending on the mutation. Um, so they're in various positions. And I'll come back to where those positions are because it becomes important later. But in terms of this slide, they're kind of scattered around on the myosin motor domain. Now we can measure these parameters. This is simple biochemical ATP ACE assay, where you look at the rate of ATP hydrolysis as a function of actin concentration. And you get, you know, a michaelis menten curve for the wild type protein, which we're now able to make in the laboratory. Um, for the last four or five years, this has been available. Before that time, no one could express human cardiac myosin in the lab uh, because it just wasn't able to be made in a functional form in baclovirus or regular bacterial cells where no myosins can be made in a functional form. Um, but now one can make the human myosin. So everything I'm showing you in this talk is using bona fide human beta cardiac myosin expressed in the lab, either wild type or carrying an HCM mutation. So 251N, uh, H251N change is one of the pediatric early onsets. And as you can see, it's got a higher ATPase, hypercontractile at this level of the ATPase. And what that means is uh, if the ATPase is higher, the KCAT is a higher number, that means the cycle time has gone down because it's going through the cycle faster. And if the cycle time is smaller, then the ensemble force from this equation goes up and you're hypercontractile. Okay? Um, we can measure the velocity. You've seen this in an earlier lecture where you put the human beta cardiac myosin with or without mutations on a glass slide and you use fluorescently labeled actin and you add ATP and you can get a velocity measurement within a minute or two that's really quite accurate and compare the mutant form from the wild type form. Um, we can measure the intrinsic force of the motor using the dual beam laser trap that we talked about in an earlier lecture. Um, and using that trap, we're able to measure force transients and get out what the intrinsic force of the single myosin molecule is that's interacting with this single actin filament. So what do we see when we use these tools to look at these parameters of intrinsic force, velocity, and ATPase? Well, when you look at the pediatric mutations, and all of these numbers are fraction of wild type, so I've normalized them, so you're just comparing to the wild type. So 1.4 means that this mutation causes a 40% increase in the intrinsic force of the motor. That mutation causes a 90% increase, almost a doubling of the velocity of the motor, and a 50% increase in the ATPase. So all three factors contribute to hypercontractility at the power output level. Same is true for this pediatric early onset mutation H251N, 30%, 40%, 40% increase. So it's no wonder that the clinical hypercontractility phenotype uh, is happening in these small children. But what surprised us after a lot of work was what you see when you look at the more typical and more common form of HCM, which is adult onset hypercon hypercontractility. I'm sorry, adult onset HCM. Uh, even adult onset patients are hypercontractile from day one because the mutations are causing hypercontractility. Um, but it doesn't look like we can explain that hypercontractility by changes in intrinsic force velocity and ATPase because when we start looking at that in detail, take R403Q, for example, that adult onset mutation, 
gives you, well, it does give you a 20% increase in velocity and a 30% increase in ATPase, but the intrinsic force is down 20%. And if you try to model that as to how the power output has changed, it's kind of hard to, to really convince yourself that that accounts for the hypercontractility. Same way with R453C, a 50% increase in intrinsic force. And when we saw that, we said, oh, that, that's, that's going to be the reason for the hypercontractility. But 20% decrease in velocity with that mutation, 30% decrease in ATPase, you can't convince yourself that you can uh, model that to explain the, the increase in, in, in contractility in the muscle. And even worse are these two cases where none of the parameters compared to wild type change at all. So with standard deviations of 0.1, these are identical at all three uh, kinds of assays, ATP, ACE, or velocity, and intrinsic force. You can imagine the poor postdoc who spent a year getting these numbers and finding that they just don't add up to give you hypercontractility. So something else is going on. And we were scratching our heads about what this is. And we realized that you know, we weren't paying any attention to this parameter NA, capital NA, the number of functionally available heads for contraction. What if this is not a fixed value? Because we had always assumed that this was just the number of heads in the muscle. But what if that's actually a variable? And this part of uh, my talk actually comes out of a dream. And it has to do with my pastime uh, of flying, which is the 1% of the time I'm not in the lab thinking about science. Um, and I love to fly. This was a plane I actually owned, a really beautiful Piper Comanche. I love to fly over the Southwest, made a very famous uh, trip to the Southwest with uh, Karen Dell and Ron Vale 25 years ago now in this very same airplane on a camping trip that was great. Uh, this happens to be uh, with my five grandchildren. Loving, I love to fly over these Southwest mesas. Um, one night, this is the dream. And this happened December 14th, 2014. I'm going to bed, and my wife, Anna, who some of you know, said, you know, stop thinking about myosin for one night and read this book. It's a murder mystery in the Southwest. You love, you love it. It's called The Haunted Mesa. And so I said, OK, OK, and I started reading this book. 20 pages in, I fell asleep. What she was attempting completely failed because I dreamt that myosin has a mesa. And I woke up at 5 o'clock with this dream, and I said, gee, i got to go look at this. And I pulled up the myosin structure and started looking at what we've always noticed. I mean, all st structural biologists who think about myosin have always noticed that it has somewhat of a flat surface, but no one's ever paid any attention to the importance of that flat surface before. Um, and the first thing I did that morning was to look and see whether there was anything unusual about the surface. For example, were the residues on that surface unusually highly conserved compared to residues on the rest of the molecule? And I found, you know, before 6 a.m., that in fact they were, and, and that was a very interesting result. And then I put onto the structure all of the mutations that we were beginning to study in the lab that were clearly uh, clinically relevant for HCM. And um, normally, when you look at the structure, you have it in different orientations. And it looks like, as you saw in that earlier slide, that the mutations are kind of everywhere. But it turns out if you turn the molecule to look in this location, 
which is shown on the left here, almost all the mutations we're studying actually are up on top of this mesa. That can't be a coincidence. Not only that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those turn out to be arginine residues, positively charged, sitting on this surface. And it just looked like this surface may be a platform by binding some other protein. And what else is in the vicinity of the myosin? Um, well, there is a protein that we are working on called myosin binding protein C. And that's another part of this story, but makes the story too long. So you'll have to read our papers on myosin binding protein C. Uh, but the other protein that's very near the myosin heads is the myosin tail itself. And the reason the myosin tail looked interesting is because the very first part of the myosin tail, which is this coiled coil, turns out is another hot spot for HCM mutations. One hot spot being this mesa, shown with the pink residues, or the dark pink residues on the other head. And the other hot spot is this first part, or what we call the proximal part of S2. Those mutations in the proximal S2 are all negatively charged. They're aspartates or glutamates. So this can't be an accident that you've got all these arginines on the mesa, and you've got all these glutamates and aspartates negatively charged on this proximal S2. So what if the heads are folding back onto their own tail, and there's an electrostatic interaction between these arginine residues and these aspartate residues, holding some of the heads in the muscle in an off state sequestering them, and this equilibrium, if it's perturbed, would then change capital NA. It would change the number of functionally accessible heads for the muscle. And so our argument was, which with no data, was that if this could be folding back in this way, then these mutations may be weakening this complex, shifting the equilibrium to the left in this slide, giving you more heads in play to interact with actin, and hence you're hypercontractile. This is a totally new way of thinking about uh, hyper, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So at this point, looking back in the literature as to whether people have really noticed uh, in anything like these folded back heads, uh, we realized that there was literature way back in 2008 and even earlier, where there's actually quite a bit of, of literature from, especially from uh, this laboratory, uh, from this paper by Alamo et al. And this is from Raul Padron's laboratory in South America, where they study tarantula, skeletal muscle, uh, thick filaments, because they seem to be more highly preserved structurally than any other thick filament that people have looked at. And you can quite nicely see the helical array of myosin heads projecting out from the thick filament background. So this is, this is looking at a very small section of the uh, thick filament. But you can see, and those are clearly myosin heads, because that's really quite well established. But the striking thing, as you can see from this one colored yellow, is that it looks like these heads are folded back, in fact, on their own proximal S2. So what I did was I took the human cardiac sequence, and I used a drone's tarantula folded back model as a template to create a, um, a folded back human cardiac model. And I say I did that, but in fact, um, a very talented postdoctoral fellow, Margaret Sunita, was the one who uh, did more than guide me through this. So I should say she created this structure. Um, 
if you look at this model from what's called the front side, which means that uh, this is the side you would see if you're looking at the thick filament, um, where the proximal tail is on the back side. Um, this is what it looks like. And if you put in where HCM mutations, you, you can see that there, there are virtually none on this side of the molecule. And you know, the question is, where is the myosin mesa in this folded back tarantula structure? Turns out the mesa, which I've now colored the residues in pink, light pink for one head and dark pink for the second head, those two mesas are in orthogonal positions compared to each other. And they're cradling the proximal S2 that has these negative charges, while the mesa has all of these arginine residues. So this was really incredibly exciting and uh, couldn't be an accident that you had these two oppositely charged uh, eight residues which, when mutated, caused HCM. And again, we were immediately thinking that what these mutations that take you from the arginine to something else or the glutamate aspartate to something else may be weakening this folded back structure, getting more heads into play so that they uh, can interact with actin and therefore producing hypercontractility. So this just seemed like a, a really nice way of potentially having a more unifying model for what the basis of HCM really is. But we wanted to try to get some evidence for this. And we wanted to know, well, does proximal S2 actually bind to S1 physically, biochemically? Uh, and for this, we used a very new technique, which many of you probably haven't heard about, called microscale thermophoresis, or MST. And this is really a, a beautiful approach because it doesn't perturb anything um, and you, you basically have two proteins in solution in a microcapillary, shown here in blue. And what you do is you take a laser beam and you locally, in that little capillary, heat up the sample suddenly by about five degrees. And what happens is, because of the temperature jump, the molecules begin to diffuse in that spot. And the rate at which they diffuse depends on their molecular weight. So if these two proteins are independent, they're diffusing at one rate. But if they're binding to each other, they diffuse at a different rate. They're slower diffusion. And you can pick that up in this instrument. Um, and, and this is uh, an instrument made by a company called NanoTemper. Okay? And I urge you to look this up on the web and, and understand how it goes on because it's very powerful because it enables you to actually look at uh, the interaction in solution without perturbing the system in any other way. And what we did was we looked at binding not to the S1, full-sized S1 head, but we actually make, made um, motor domains that were missing the regulatory binding, the, the regulatory light chain binding site, and only had this brown colored essential light chain. So it's a short S1, which we abbreviate S, small s, S1. A short version of S1 still has the, uh, the pink uh, domain, which is the mesa. And now we separately make the proximal S2, which you can easily make in bacteria. So you can make lots of this. And now you do a binding experiment where you take a small amount of short S1. You have a fluorescent tag on it, which you need to have in order to follow it in the MST experiment. And you put increasing concentrations of proximal S2 until you finally see, as shown here, the uh, binding that gives you this curve. And you get a nice binding curve, which you can see is, uh, in the case of the 25 millimolar salt, has a low micromolar affinity, but it's very salt dependent. If you go to lower salt, it's tighter. If you go to higher salt, like 100 millimolar, it's, it's weaker. But notice you can measure even 20, 30, 40 micromolar KDs uh, 
reasonably accurately with this technique, which is really quite nice. So these two proteins do interact physically with each other. And what about our hypothesis that the mutations would alter the affinity of this interaction? And specifically, we predicted they would weaken the affinity and not strengthen it. By weakening the affinity, heads would go out and be able to interact with actin and cause hypercontractility. So we wanted to test this. And so in very recent work, oh, I should say that in that previous slide, you should notice that some of these mutants, like this one and this one and this one, are not anywhere near this tail. Whereas others, there are several right behind the tail, which is, those are the ones I'm going to show you in this next slide. Those three that are right behind the tail, H251N, R249Q, R453C, cause an order of magnitude shift in the affinity, weakens the affinity by an order of magnitude. Notice that this x-axis is a logarithmic scale. So these, which are in a position in the structural model, and by the way, obviously this is just a model. That's not a real structure. It's something we created by using tarantula, skeletal, folded back structure as a template. Um, and so we don't yet know what the real structure is. But what this experiment is starting to do is to map out using genetics whether that structure has any validity. And sure enough, those mutations of those residues that are near the S2 tail weaken the affinity of the S2 binding. Whereas, for example, R403Q, which is nowhere near the tail, doesn't have any effect. So that's a very exciting first step. Another set of mutations we looked at was in the S2. Okay, so uh, 870H is an arginine residue in the S2 tail which, when mutated, causes HCM. But that residue is near, nowhere near the mesa in the structural model. And indeed, it doesn't change the affinity, as you can see, compared to wild type. Whereas D906G is over the mesa. It's an aspartate negatively charged. And when you change it to a glycine, you basically wipe out the interaction of the S2 with that short S1. So this is just the beginnings of experimental evidence. An awful lot has to be done. But our hypothesis, which we're working on, which I'll bet will be largely correct in the end, is that hypercontractility in clinical hypercontractility is caused by many HCM mutations, if not most, by primarily changing the value of Na and increasing it by shifting this equilibrium between heads that are folded back in an off state with heads that are now able to cycle with the actin. So in my drawing, which is in a review I wrote a couple of years ago that I drew to scale of heads uh, interacting with actin, and I thought this is the way the muscle sarcomer work, looked. Um, that's not what I think the sarcomere looks like. I think the real sarcomere looks like this, with maybe as many as half the heads that are actually not functionally accessible for interaction, acting with actin. Notice when you draw a list to scale that the number of heads that are actually interacting with actin, considering that a lot of them are sequestered, and then you have this duty ratio feature, the number of green heads that are really interacting with an actin filament during a systolic contraction is three or four. Okay? It's a really low number. It's not the picture that I think I and many other people in the muscle business had. So in conclusion, uh, we're characterizing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM, mutations in human beta cardiac myosin for changes in these four fundamental parameters for power output. Uh, we're giving particular attention, given what I told you, uh, to the myosin mesa. Uh, 
where more than half of all myosin HCM mutations lie. Now remember, this myosin mesa came out of a dream. And so a really important part of the story today was to emphasize how important it is to go to bed at night thinking deeply about your science, where during the day, your left hemisphere is operating to just give you snapshots of what's going on, and you don't necessarily synthesize everything, and you usually go to bed being a little confused about what some of your results were telling you. And you need to go to bed thinking about that so that during the night when your right hemisphere is working, uh, and you now put together those facts, you quite often, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, uh, wake up with an aha moment realizing um, something that you didn't when you went to bed that night. Uh, that's clearly what happened to me in the case of this myosin mesa dream, and it's just one great example of why it's important to dream a lot. Finally, the myosin mesa, uh, I think, is going to be, turn out to be involved in fine-tuned regulation of cardiac contractility in general, and is likely to be really the pivotal player in causing hypercontractility in HCM. So with that, uh, let me first give acknowledgments for current and recent members of my lab, a number of collaborators from, from various walks of life, uh, from mechanical engineering to clinical uh, uh, physician scientists, uh, physicists, and so on, uh, as well as a number of folks in Bangalore where I've had a long-term association with the National Center for Biological Sciences and a new institute there, uh, which is associated with NCBS, called INSTEM. And also, of course, thanks for more than 40 years of support from the National Institutes of Health and really very important uh, support from the Human Frontiers Science Program. And finally, let me thank you for uh, being patient and, and listening to not only this seminar, uh, but hopefully you've watched all four of my seminars at this point. And uh, I'm hoping that you got something out of it. Uh, I very much enjoyed presenting them. Uh, so thank you very much.